There's a song that I don't want us to sing necessarily, but I want to read it to you in the course book. Uh, John Wimber wrote it. I don't know if you know who John Wimber was. He used to be a Quaker before they ran him off. And uh, he made him a little nervous because he believed in some pretty fanatical things about the Holy Spirit, like he still healed people and did miracles and some of that. And some of our friends thought he was a little far out, believe it or not. And I don't know what you think, but if he was, I am too. So, um, But let this song kind of just soak into you as a word from the Lord this morning. We're going to be talking more about the Holy Spirit. He says, Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with his Spirit and his love. So this morning, let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you. And his spirit, like a dove, will descend upon your life and make you whole. Let him enfold you this morning. Let him take you in his arms. Get a hug from God. <laughs> Let him satisfy your soul. He's the only thing that can. He's the only one that can satisfy our soul. Well, Lord, this morning we always need your help when we look at your word. You promised us the spirit that would help us when we study your word. You'd make it known to us. You'd reveal it to us. You'd show it to us. And so we ask you this morning that you would allow your Holy Spirit to teach us, guide us, instruct us, bless us, encourage us, and use us. So as we look at your word, we open ourselves to that this morning, and we pray that in the most wonderful, glorious, powerful name of Jesus, the name that seemed to upset some of the religious leaders in Peter and Paul's day, uh, but they're sweet to our ears this morning. Thank you for that. Amen. So last week we looked at Acts chapter 3, and we saw a man who was crippled from birth, about 40 years. And we saw some of the gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit beginning to come into action for the first time through Peter and John and the early disciples. Uh, we saw 2,000 new converts on the day of Pentecost. People excited about what God was doing. Now, in chapter 4 of Acts, we find out, actually, that everyone really wasn't happy, believe it or not. There were some people there that weren't happy and weren't excited about what was going on. The religious leaders and the Jews were greatly disturbed, the scripture says, by the apostles proclaiming Jesus' resurrection. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them into jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. 2,000 more were added that day. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem Annas the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. And this is what they questioned them about. They said, by what power and by what name, by what power and by what name did you do this? Here is this man who was crippled for 40 years standing, and they want to know by whose name and by what power Peter and John had done this. 
Now, what do you think Peter and John were thinking? Here they were brought before the, the leaders of the day, questioned, and uh, they had to come up with some kind of a response, a lot of pressure on them. Uh, I wonder if they remembered what Jesus had told them uh, that Luke records in chapter 12, verse 11. Jesus had told them once before, maybe on a hillside as they sat there or as they were having a meal together. He said, when you're brought before the synagogue and rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. I think that would come to my mind, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't it yours at this time? This was what was happening. They were being questioned by the religious leaders in the synagogue, and uh, they were not very happy with Peter and John. Then Peter, oh yeah, that's the problem with Peter. See, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. That seems to be a problem to some religious leaders. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness, now wait a minute, an act of kindness, that's one of the fruits, isn't it, of the Spirit. How about that? How would you like to be called before the church leaders because of your act of kindness? <laughs> one of the fruits of the Spirit. The act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, now wait a minute, that was a gift of the Holy Spirit, too, and one of the ministries. So here we have an act of kindness, which is the fruit of the Spirit, and a, and a gift of the Spirit. And Peter says, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now here's the problem. Whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. This man stands before you healed. Well, you know, when Jesus was crucified, that wasn't spectacular. There had been a lot of people crucified, but none of them had risen from the dead. And that was the doctrine. That was the thing they were trying to put down. This miracle was causing a lot of problems to the Jewish leaders. And here's Peter and John, filled with the Holy Spirit now, doing an act of kindness, fruit of the Spirit, healed, ministry and gift of the Holy Spirit, in the name and power of Jesus, whom they had crucified and who had come back, who had resurrected. So this new thing that was bothering them, something new, something different. Get rid, get rid, get used to different, right? Get used to different. And here's the evidence. This man who was crippled for 40 years standing before them. There was no way to deny that. The one yesterday who had gotten so carried away that he doesn't have to be carried away anymore. Except in church. <laughs> we can get a little carried away when we think about it. Now Peter proclaims and preaches what the psalmist had prophesied years before. In Psalm 118 verse 22. The, the psalmist prophesied that Jesus was the cornerstone that the faith would be built upon. And he says, the stone you builders rejected, which what is what they were doing at the moment, which has become the cornerstone. And Jesus had told the disciples earlier in Luke 24, verse 46, he says, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Now, is that interesting? That's where this is happening, years and years later. In Jerusalem, in Luke 24, verse 49, Jesus said, I'm going to send you what my fathers promised, but stay in the city. What city? Jerusalem. That's where they were. And you, until you have been clothed with power from on high, your witnessing clothes, <laughs> your new suit, <laughs> your new ability, clothed with power from on high. Acts 2, 1 through 4, he did what he said he would do on the day of Shabbat, or which was the day of Pentecost. In Acts 4, 8, it says, And now here stands Peter 
and John boldly before their critics, the religious leaders, telling them that salvation is not found in keeping their laws, but rather in believing in Jesus and doing what he's telling them. By what power did you do this miracle, they asked Peter. And Peter is saying that uh, Jesus is the only one. There's no other way. No other name under heaven given to men by which man can be saved. Now this is the same Peter that they knew. They had seen Peter a lot in uh, verse 13 of chapter 4. They, they'd seen Peter uh, cowardly denying that he ever knew Jesus in the courtyard. I think I gave you the wrong scripture for that. Verse 13, but I think it might have been Luke. In the courtyard, he's, he's warming himself by the fire and denying three times that he even knew Jesus. This was the Peter who was nowhere to be seen when Jesus was hanging on the cross. This is the Peter who was hiding in the upper room, afraid of the, the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders, until something different happened to him. Something happened in that upper room. A little flames like tongues of fire came out of somewhere, and a rushing wind, and the Holy Spirit came through the city, and people were changed. They were different. Get used to different. Say, get used to different. I want to hear you say it. Get used to different. Yeah, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, things are different. Sometimes preachers can get ahead in their preaching schedules and get two sermons in one week. Believe it or not, I believe it. So what could these leaders say when they saw this man healed who had been crippled for 40 years? We see this man standing before us who has undoubtedly been healed. Can't argue that. Everyone in Jerusalem knows it, they said. But we have to stop this madness. If this is madness, give me some of it. <laughs> I like it, don't you? Verse 15 says they told them to leave so they could have a meeting to decide what to do. That's when you call a meeting. You know, that's why you have committees. And the agenda was, what are we going to do with Peter and John? That was the agenda for the meeting. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. But they took note of one thing. These men had been with somebody. They'd been with Jesus. Since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What, we're going to do, what are we going to do with these men, they asked. And, and everyone living in Jerusalem knows they perform this notable sign that they're not taking credit for, actually. They're saying it was not them that did it, but it was done in the name and in the power of Jesus. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer in his name. Now, how many of you think that's going to do any good? It might have worked before Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I don't think it's going to work now, do you? So you've got Peter and John. They're not college graduates or seminary students. They're just sort of common folks unschooled, ordinary men, but they're doing miracles that the rabbis can't do, who are the smart people. And this is embarrassing. This is disturbing. They had to stop this thing from happening. This thing. What thing? People getting healed? People getting saved, people getting filled with the Holy Spirit, this thing, we've got to stop this thing. I'd like to see it started again, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's what I want to see started, not stopped. 
They just saw this man crippled from birth, walking, jumping, praising God, and they wanted to stop it. It didn't fit their doctrine. It didn't fit their way of doing church, as we would say. We have to stop this thing from spreading. It's not a good Quaker way. I'm, well, they didn't say Quaker. People are getting healed, saved, filled with the Spirit. What are we going to do? Easy. We'll just tell them to stop, or we'll put them in jail. Now, how many of you would be afraid if somebody told you to stop, or you'd be put in jail in Scotts Mills, besides Wanda and Jeannie? Because they know what the jail looks like. It wouldn't hold... <laughs> It would only, if you want to see what the jail looks like, you can drive down across the street here. Look, it, it would only hold about two people, and I think you could just kick the wall out. <laughs> that, that used to be the jail. But, but evidently, this was a pretty secure place, and they had guards. But the problem is, Peter and John are different now. Peter and John are different now. Are you different than you once were before you came to know the Lord and before His Spirit came into your life? They're not afraid of people anymore. They say that we killed their leader, but God raised him from the dead. So they're not afraid of death either. It's evident something, ha something has happened to these people. Verse 18 says, call them in, we'll straighten them out once and for all. So they called them in again, and they commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. That's what you call an executive order. We have a lot of executive orders going around today. They shouldn't do it. But Peter and John replied, verse 19, judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking what we have seen and heard. You see, they're doing exactly what Jesus had told them they were going to be doing when the Holy Spirit came into their life. They're witnessing. They're telling what they have seen and what they have heard. They're not evangelizing. They're just witnessing. They're just telling what they saw and what they heard, what they experienced. And, you know, this is still happening today, and it should be happening even more. Today, we're beginning to live in a situation where teachers and pastors are being threatened not to say certain things anymore. Did you know that? There's certain words that are not proper for us to use. Words like same-sex marriage, mother and father, male and female. Uh, many churches are even teaching that uh, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was a lack of hospitality. They've forgotten that God created a man and a woman, and that was it. Now, I'll admit, we live in a messed up world. But we're the ones that messed it up. God didn't. God created it. So keep your eyes and your ears open. It's coming. And I would suggest that it's a good thing to be filled with the Holy Spirit as this comes to our land. Firm in the faith that God's called us into. And I want you to remember this. This is good. You know, there's always bad news, but there's always good news, too. This is all coming. This is bad news. But something else is coming. His name is Jesus. Yeah. He's coming back. He's promised us that. So anyway, they threatened them, but it didn't do any good. And verse 21 says, after further threats, they let them go. What are we going to do? They couldn't decide how to punish them. Because the people were all praising God for what happened. They saw this man, 40 years crippled, and here he is jumping around praising God. How are you going to put that down? You might ask, why, are, why aren't all the people praising God today? Why aren't all the people praising God today? But that would really be the wrong question. The question is, why isn't the church filled with the Holy Spirit doing the things that they were doing? in that day? That's the question for us. Why aren't we receiving power and boldness from on high? Why aren't the gifts of the Holy Spirit being manifest today more and more? Why isn't the fruit of the Spirit 
ripening <laughs> more in our lives. Well, verse 23 says, Peter and John were released. They went back to their own people and reported all the things the chief priest and the elders had said to them. To their own people. I kind of like that. It doesn't mean uh, a different race or a different uh, sex or a different whatever. It means they went back to their own people. Do you know who your own people are? Your own people are the ones that believe the way you do. The ones that put Jesus first. That's who they went back to. The group of 5,000 that had begun to believe in Jesus and put their faith in Jesus and began to be filled by the Holy Spirit. That's your kind of people. That's my kind of people. We love everybody, but those are our people. The ones that believe that and do that. What was the congregation's response? When they went back, when Peter and John went back to the group, their people, how did they respond? They, did they pray, oh God, what are we going to do now? Oh God, protect us from these evil people around us. Don't let any harm come our way, Lord. No, that's not what they prayed. They raised their voices in prayer to God, and in verse 29 it says, they said, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's what I'm praying today. I'm not praying, protect me from people. I'm praying, Lord, give me boldness to do what you told me to do. That's where it's at. God never gave us the Holy Spirit to make us timid. And if you feel timid and bashful and not able to talk about Jesus, ask the Holy Spirit to fill some more places in your life. Not change your disposition or your personality, but just to give you boldness. If you've been timid and not too bold, that will even confound people more when they see the Holy Spirit in you. And what happened when they prayed that prayer? It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. That happened before, didn't it? On the day of Pentecost. After they prayed this, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit again, some of them. Not just once, but again. And you remember in Ephesians, the Bible says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit, because we need to keep being filled, because... When we serve God, that energy, that spirit goes out of us to others. And we need to be refilled, recharged every day. I wake up in the middle of the night and I say, Lord, refill me. <laughs> That's my prayer even in the middle of the night now. Refill me, Lord. Keep me full. Because when things shake you, one of two things happen. The building shook. People were shaken. One of two things will happen. You'll either fall apart when you're shaken or you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Which do you want to be? <laughs> do you want to be nervous, frightened, afraid, scared, doubtful, or do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power and boldness? And notice how they got along with each other. Boy, I tell you, this is a group. As the believers were one in heart and mind, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought their money at the sales, put it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to anyone who had needs. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to sell everything you own. Um, in some place in South America, pastors were preaching that, and, and they, they were thinking if everybody just sold their houses and brought it all to the church, they could administer it and everybody would be blessed. Well, what they found out was they had so much stuff, they couldn't even know where to get rid of it when the people did this. And they finally told them, take it back, and just use it for God. So it isn't that I want you to bring everything here next. I mean, no way. Don't do that. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Neither would the church. But realize it's not yours. It belongs to God. 
and use it the way the Holy Spirit tells you to use it. Well, when I read this about them being one in heart and mind and not claiming stuff as their own, knowing it's from God and they should use it as God shows them, this is the kind of church I want to be a part of. It doesn't have to be a church of 2,000. It can be a church of 15. But it's the kind of church that God will bless and use. And that's the kind of person that I want to be. We don't have to be 2,000. We just have to be who Jesus wants us to be. That's the kind of church I want to be in. That's the kind of person I want to be. How about you? Well, has God been whispering things to you this week? The Holy Spirit talks. Sometimes he shouts when we don't listen good. But sometimes he just whispers. <laughs> and we hear him. So let's wait a few moments. If there's something you want to share that God has been sharing with you, feel free to do that. And then I'll close. I think the name of the sermon for next Sunday is The Great Pretender, Gary. And you'll find that Anani and Sapphira, Sapphira were great pretenders. They pretended that they were doing things that they weren't doing. And it was a serious lesson to the whole church. So let's listen to the Holy Spirit this week, and I'll be anxious to hear you share what he tells you this week and the excitement that comes in your life as a result. Father, dismiss us with your blessing now as we go. We go empowered by your Holy Spirit, listening to you to do the work that you call us to do with the gifts that you give us and we certainly will give you the praise and the honor for all that you do. Help us to be witnesses of what you did and are doing in our lives today as we go out to others. We pray in the blessed, powerful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.